you take your Bible this morning, take your Bible, if you will, to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 1, Proverbs chapter 1 this morning. I don't know about you, but man, this last week was quite an interesting week. Uh, it, it, uh, on Friday was the capstone of all of it. I mean, it was just one problem after another. You, you have uh, days like that, you know, you have weeks like that, and Friday was one of those days. I mean, it, it just started off on the wrong foot, never got on the right foot. It kept getting one thing after another. And I, I finally told somebody, I think I'm going home going to bed, and hopefully it'll be better tomorrow, you know. But uh, And it did get a little better yesterday, so I'm glad of that, uh, one of those kind of things. But, you know, hey, we have days like that in life. You can't let them get you down. You can't let those days destroy you. Uh, there was great news this week, though. I don't know if you saw it. I don't know if you knew it. And maybe if you're on Facebook, you may have seen it or heard it. But Brother Michael Moore is now officially engaged to be married. Okay. So uh, if you didn't know that, he is he's back in Children's Church this morning. But he, he is officially, officially engaged. And my wife and I were out on... Uh, uh, one of the things we did on yesterday, and uh, we were up, one of our bus kids were playing uh, an instrument, and we were going to go hear them, and uh, my wife introduced Michael's girlfriend, said, this is his girlfriend. I said, no, no, that's his fiance. Uh, it's got official now, so, uh, but anyhow, that's good for him. I don't know exactly when they're going to get married. They're working on that. All of you, you prepare to go to the wedding. It'll be in Ogden, Utah. I'm sure that'll be no problem. we we'll just take a bus, right? Uh, but uh, they'll be getting married. He's marrying a young lady from up there. He uh, said, how did he meet her? He met her because Leela Jewell married uh, Brother Mahaney. They got married here, and she had a girl come down for that wedding, that's where Michael met her. So be careful when you go to weddings, you single people, all right? No telling what can happen there, all right? Proverbs chapter one, Proverbs chapter one, if you will. I wanna begin reading in verse 22. The word of God says, how long ye simple ones will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof, behold, I will part my spirit unto you, I will make known my words unto you, because I have called and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but ye have set at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Notice, I mean, if you will, verse 27, right in the middle of that verse, it says, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the word of God. Thank you, Lord, for all that we find in it. Lord, the great news of salvation. Lord, how we can know that we can be born again, how we can know that we have a home in heaven. But Lord, we also thank you for the warning that's given to us, where you warn us of things to come, you warn us about our sin, and Lord, I pray you would help us to heed what's said. Lord, bless today in the message time, and Lord, bless during the preaching service. I pray, Lord, you'd give us good attention, and may the Word of God speak to every heart today. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we live in a day where a lot of people have created a Christianity and they've created a God that have little resemblance to the God of the Bible and no resemblance to biblical Christianity. But yet they call themselves Christians. Their God is not the Jehovah God of the Bible. He's not the creator of heaven and earth. He's not the God who sent his son to die for the sins of man. And he's not the God who has promised that he's going to deal with sin. He will judge sin. You say, now come on, preacher, what makes you say that? Well, because of what we find 
in verse 26 and verse 27 that we read this morning. Would you look there with me, all right? Verse 26 says, I also will laugh at your calamity. Yes, I will mock when your fear cometh. Yes, Wait a minute, I'll tell you, most people would rebel at the idea that God would do such a thing. But that's what the Bible says. Notice, when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. Now, you know, some people say, oh man, God's just love. God's a God of love. He loves and he loves everybody. Uh, we have people today that say our loving God would never send a person to a place like hell where they would be tormented forever and ever. And God just wouldn't do that. Wait a minute, that's the God of the Bible will. The God of the Bible will. Now the God that's been created in the hearts and minds of a lot of people who want to live the way they want to live, they, they have problems with that. Here though, in, in these verses, we've got a picture that disturbs that, that crowd that believes in a God that will never get upset never condemns anyone, right. never is, is mad, will never judge and will never destroy. But listen, in spite of what those folks say and in spite of what those folks believe, my Bible says that destruction cometh as a whirlwind. Right. Destruction cometh as a whirlwind. Now, I, I realize when a preacher gets up and preaches like this, somebody said, man, that's great. All you are is doom and gloom. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute, there's a reason. There's a reason things happen. You, you found that out, right? There's a reason. There's a reason. Um, I, I mentioned to you some of the problems on Friday. On Friday, we had some kids come down and bust some windows at the school, at our school building. And, and I, I, it was almost like the Lord had spoken to me and warned me. And I kind of feel like, I guess it's my fault it happened. I was at the school, I looked, and there alongside the building, there were two pieces of bricks. Right. And I saw those two bricks, and the first thing I thought, where'd that come from? I have no idea where they came from. And I thought, probably ought to go pick those up. Somebody used them to knock a hole in the window. You see, it's my fault. I, knew, I looked at them, I thought that, but I didn't go pick them up and put them in the back of my truck. Now, if you go look in the back of my pickup today, those two pieces of brick are in there. It's a little bit late, you see, but there's a reason things happen. You said, well, is the reason the, the windows got busted because the bricks were there? No, they were just there. The reason it happened is because kids, the Bible said, sins bound the heart of a child, all right? And kids do stuff. There's a reason. Things happen for a reason. When God tells us that he's going to laugh at your calamity and, and, and destruction's going to come as a whirlwind, there's a reason. Yes, sir. There's a reason. I want you to consider with me from the scriptures this morning why the Bible tells us these things will happen. First of all, would you look back there, all right? Would you look at verse 23? Would you look at verse 23? Notice what verse 23 says. Turn you at my reproof. Turn you at my reproof. A reproof has been offered. The Bible tells us that it's time for the simple to quit loving their simplicity. It's time for the scorners to quit scorning. And it's time for fools to seek rather than to hate knowledge. Hey, you say, who in the world is that? The simple. Basically, when the Word of God speaks of simple, He's talking about people not who are uh, just live simply. No, He's talking about people really it describes folks that are careless, that are indifferent, if you will, and that make no effort really to, to do what they ought to do, to even discover the great value of, of things of God, but they're just indifferent to it. They're, they're careless about doing what they should. The scorners are those people that mock such things as purity. Amen. They mock such things as integrity and holiness. Yes, There's a lot of scorners in the world. There's a lot of simple in the world. The fools are the ones that actively oppose anything that is godly or holy. I remind you, the Bible said the fool has said in his heart there is no God. So that's the fools, that's the scorners, that's the simple. And the Bible says God has reproved them. 
reprove them. He's done his part to reprove sinners. He's reproved them. Now I want you to think about that word reprove. Well, the word reproof, if you look the dictionary definition it up, it talks about it is a to scold or correct in a gentle manner. To gently scold and correct. Not the way I do it. Hey, cut it out! That, that's, no, God's gentle. He's gently, he's gently reproved. The simple. Hey, he's got reproof for people that get indifferent and careless in the way they live. He, he reproves us. It's a gentle thing. It's a gentle thing. It's, it's not that... It's not that screaming deal. It's not that. It's not the harsh. It's not bap upside the head. No, it's a gentle thing. It's hey, listen. You need to be careful. You're making a mistake. You're making a mistake. The Bible tells us God's reproved those people. He's reproved that crowd that's simple, those that are scorners, those that are fools. He's gently pointed out to them their error. You say, well, now, preacher, how'd he do it? Well, he did it one way, with a conscience. With a conscience. God put a conscience in you. Now, if you've got a conscience, you know when you do wrong. You know it. It's immediately, and your conscience will rebuke you. Your conscience speaks to you. Your conscience makes you feel bad. It helps you to realize, man, I shouldn't have done that. That was a mistake. I, I, I shouldn't have done what I just did. Your conscience will reprove you. Hey, listen, you know why it's that way? God put it in you. God put it in you. So that's one way He's reproved you. I'll tell you another way He's done it. He's done it with Scripture. He's done it with Scripture. You know, it, it's no accident that you can sometimes be driving down the highway and see a billboard with Scripture on it. Maybe... Scripture on the back of a t-shirt. Right. You know, that's gentle reproof. That's, it. Yes, sir. that's just gentle reproof. Yeah. You see that? I have a scripture sign in my front yard, and uh, several of you do. You've got scripture signs out there. So what's the purpose of that gentle reproof? Yeah. It's just trying to point out to people, hey, watch out. Right. Yes, hey, listen, trying to give you a warning. Trying to give you a warning. Hey, he's done that. He, he's given this crowd, those that are simple, those that are scorners, those that are fools, he's given them gentle reproof. Uh, he, he sent a preacher by. He's used preaching for that purpose. Uh, and by the way, it's not always preaching from the platform in the church, behind the pulpit with an open Bible. Sometimes it's individual Christians that go by and knock on somebody's door and try to reprove them and try to point out, listen, there's a Savior that died for you and uh, you're going to be held accountable for your sin. That's a gentle reproof. Gentle reproof. Uh, I'm glad God's reproved him. He's done his part. He's done everything he can. You know what else he's done? I'll tell you one other way he reproves people. He, he reproves that crowd with the testimony and with the life and the witness of a godly individual that puts that crowd to shame. Right. Now, they may be in a situation and, it, and you could have been the one that used, God used to reprove somebody. Right. You did right. And, and the crowd, maybe at work, man, made fun of you. But I don't tell you what. You see what did? God used your right action. God used your good testimony to reprove that crowd. Oh, they might have been there. They might have been there making fun of you and mocking you and scorning you. But the truth of the matter inside is, boy, they're right and I'm wrong. Right. See, God uses the little things. God has gently reproved people. He's come along and done that. And that reproof was offered to help people. That reproof was offered to rescue that crowd that's wrong. Hey, listen, that's the reason God reproves people. I don't know about you. I, I raised two kids. You raised children. You've got children. I, I don't reprove them because I just love to do it. I don't sneak around. I, I'm sure kids at school think all I do is sneak around so I can catch them. Ah! You. I don't do that. That's not the fun thing in life to do. I didn't do that with my kids. But the reproof is offered to help. 
It's offered to hell. Listen, notice what the Bible said. The Lord says, how long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity? And ye, the scorners, delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Listen, turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I'll make known my words unto you. You know what? If you'll just turn, God's saying to him, if you'll just listen to my reproof, boy, I can help you. I can help you. Now, what happened? What happened? Look at the next verse. Because I have called, and you refused. There's the answer. God reproved you, and what people did? People refused what God said. That was the answer they gave God. He said, if you'll turn it, I'll reprove you. And he said, no, forget it, and I'm going to do that. No. God's call to repentance was refused. God's call to man that they would repent, they would turn from their sin, and, and man's answer to the call of God was no. Amen. Hey, uh, it wasn't a polite no thanks, but just a cold, absolute refusal to answer and heed God's call. I've been out knocking doors, and I've had it happen on numerous occasions. I've had people say, no, I'm not interested. And they were, they were kind about it. Now, I think they're making a terrible mistake, but they were kind. They would say, I'm not interested. Other people, Wham! Hey, I believe that's the picture here. The Bible said, because I have called and you refused. They, they looked at God and it was, no! It wasn't, no thank you. It wasn't that polite refusal. It was just an absolute steadfast, no! Not going to turn. I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to re I'm just not going to do it. Well, wait a minute. It goes beyond that. It wasn't just enough, if you will, to refuse the call of God. Look on down there what it says. He said, I've stretched out my hand and no man regarded. You have said it not all my counsel and would none of my repute proof. Hey, not only was it a refusal, it was an absolute rejection. Just a rejection. Not enough to merely refuse the call of God. That the simple, the scorners, the fools, they rejected the stretched out hand of God. God has stretched out His hand to man. He stretched out His hand to you and to me. And, and boy, so many of them would just reject the counsel of God. You say, what do you mean the counsel of God? Well, the counsel of God is found in the Word of God. The world's filled with people today. Now, wait a minute. I don't want you to get the wrong idea. I'm not up here preaching to you about people out there. I'm in here this morning preaching to you about you. And my fear is, boy, some of us, we sit and we refuse and we reject the counsel of God. God's Word gives us counsel. God's Word tells us how to deal with some things. God's Word tells us how to live. God's Word tells us how we're to interact with other people. God's Word talks to us about forgiveness. God's Word talks to us about being kind. God's Word talks to us about loving folks. God's Word talks to us about here, decisions in life. This is the way it ought to be done. What you ought to do. But so many people reject the counsel of God. Man, I, I'm not going to do that. God's extended His hand, and it, it's like somebody falling, and you go over and extend a hand to help them up, and say, I don't need your help. Yeah. You said, preacher, nobody do that to God. Oh, sure. Sure. I, I've heard arrogant people make that kind of statement. Make that kind of statement. I, I'll, I'll never forget, this is an example that comes to mind. I was visiting, and, and Jerry Chandler was a teenager at the time. He was here a few weeks ago, and Jerry was visiting with me, and we went to see this fella, and this guy, you know, we were visiting, talking to him, and he, he, was, he was a rodeo uh, rider, and he rode the Bronx, I think, if I remember correctly. And, and Jerry, being a kid, you know, he, he spoke up and he said, man, I guess you pray and ask God to help you if you're going to. And here's what the guy said. And oh, no, man, I tell God, listen, if you're back there, you better get off. There's not room for both of us on this, Lord. 
than for a rough ride. And I'm thinking, you moron. Amen. Then I looked down on his leg and I saw this metal brace on his leg. I go, well, it's working, isn't it? Yes, sir. Amen. You don't want God's help. Hey, listen, but there's plenty of people today. I mean, God's extended his hand to them, and it's, I don't need your help. Yes, sir. Amen. I don't need your help. I can do this on my own. I can do this my way. The hey, world's filled with people that have done that kind of thing. You can spot them by the way they live. You can spot them by the way they live. Now, wait a minute. I'll tell you something. I believe some of them are professing Christians. Yes, I believe they're professing Christians. Hey, they will not be faithful to the house of God. They've got an excuse. I've got all kinds of excuses. I've heard all kinds of excuses. But they've got an excuse for why they can't be faithful to the house of God. I, I just, I really get amused when people tell me, well, you don't have to go to church to worship God. Amen. Amen. Fine, I agree with that. But you do have to be faithful to the house of God to please God. The last time I looked in my Bible, uh, and I read, I've looked through the New Testament. Y'all look through it. Have you found anywhere in the New Testament where some man decided it would be a good idea to have this thing called church? Would you find the individual in the scriptures as the one that started it? Who, who's the one that started? Well, the last time, every time I read my Bible, every time I get there, I come across it and know it is the Lord Jesus Christ who said, I'll build my church. Amen. This, this business of a church, it's not man's idea, it's God's idea. Amen. And I love people who say, it's good for everybody but me. Oh, I don't need it. I'm special. Yes. Hey, listen, and that's people that profess Christ as their Savior. You can spot them. What they're doing is saying, Hey, Lord, I don't need your help. I don't need your help. Hey, uh, they, they just won't do it. They won't trust. You know, they will not uh, be faithful to the house of God. They won't shed the sins of the flesh. They won't shed the sins of the flesh. Now, wait a minute. Not only will they not shed them, but they won't get rid of them. But it's like, eh, it's no big deal. God understands. I've heard people tell me. God understands. Won't shed the sins of the flesh. You say, uh, preacher, you're, you're talking about lost people. No, I'm talking about people that profess to know the Lord. They not even try to walk in the statutes of the Bible. You ever stop and think about that? You know, God wrote this book for me and you. He wrote it for us. You know what He does? All through it, he gently reproves us. He says, nah, you better not do that. That's going to lead to trouble. That's going to lead to trouble. That's going to lead to problems. But on the other hand, if you'll do this, man, I can bless you. And, and, I, and Eve says, man, I'll open the windows of heaven for you out of blessing if you'll do these things. If you'll live this way, if you'll walk this way. Man, he said, if you'll do this, you'll be like a, a tree planted by the rivers of water. Hey, the God's, God's got some gentle reproof for us. But so many people, they won't even try to walk in the statutes of the Bible. It's like, I don't need your help, God. I can do it. They're more easily identified with the world than with heaven's crowd. You know, I, I question people that, uh, um, what's the old saying? If it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, eats like a duck, it's probably a duck. And you see people that live in the world, talk like the world, dress like the world, act like the world, and then they say, no, I'm born again, I'm saved. Right. Well, then won't you come out of that? Amen. Why don't you come out of that? And we ought to be identified with the crowd that we're part of. Amen. That would be like, you ever, you ever talk to a Marine? You ever talk to a Marine that says, I wish I'd have joined the Navy? you did, you never talked to a real Marine. All right. That ain't never happened. Somebody said, well, the Marines are branching Navy. Don't talk that way to a real Marine. All right. You don't want to hear that. You just don't want to hear that. Uh, they were in the Marine Corps. They said, man, I'm a Marine. Uh, and I don't mind being identified that way. 
Man, I tell you what, I'm a child of God. I want to be identified with Him. But there's so many people, man, the simple, the scorners, the fools. It's like, I don't want to be identified with that godly crowd. I don't want anybody to consider me that. Man, listen, we can whistle and hum, sing the ditties of the world, but we don't know anything of the great hymns of the faith. Just don't know any of them. Now, I, I've got a vast repertoire of stupid songs. Now, I mean stupid songs, okay? I can sing you all the verses of May the Bird of Paradise Fly Up Your Nose, okay? I know them. I know those. I know that song. All right, I, I can sing, you know, the verses in, in the chorus of too old to cut the mustard anymore. I know that song. I, I know that I, I could go on and on and on. All right, I know a lot of stupid songs. You say, why? I learned them on purpose. I learned them on purpose because sometimes I need entertainment. And I entertain myself. All right. I just, I can just sit back and entertain myself and have a good old time. I've learned those songs. They're just stupid. They have no real meaning. But I love that kind of stuff. And they're entertaining to me. But wait a minute. You're not going to find me singing that most of the time. You're just not going to do it. I, I, you're, you're not going to find me singing Big Mabel Murphy's Place. All right? You said, what is that? It's a stupid song. Yes, just a stupid song. All right? Now, but you're going to hang around, man. You're going to hear me whistling something, uh, you know, that that's out of the hymn book. And, uh, you, you're going to, you know, you're going to, I found myself, you know, singing and, and not even thinking. Listen, we ought to know those things. The world is filled with people that are simple. We've never been identified with the Word of God. The truth is, we've refused, we've refused Him when He reproved us. We've rejected God. We've rejected God's Word. We've rejected God's will. And the truth of the matter is, we're headed down the wrong road, okay? We're headed down the wrong road. Now, you're there in Proverbs chapter 1. Hey, listen, I want you to go back. I want you to look at those verses again. Notice what it says, turn you at my reproof. Verse 24, because I've called and you've refused. Verse 25, but you've said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. Then and only then do you see I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you. Listen, can I say this to you? God's reproved people. Maybe there's some sitting here this morning. You're sitting here and God's reproved you because you've turned the wrong direction in life. You've taken a turn that's leading down the wrong path. And God's reproved you. He's warned you. But you've shrugged it off. You, you've said almost, maybe not out loud, but by your actions, I don't need your help. I don't need that. Well, listen, I just want to tell you something. Retribution's coming. The whirlwind of destruction's coming. You say, why is that? Because sin always extracts a price. Sin has to be paid for. Just has to be. It's got to be paid for. I mean, you can mark it down. It's got to be paid for. Now, it is so interesting. I really didn't intend to bring this up. I mentioned the windows being broken. And uh, down at school, it just so happens. That always happens to my wife. She gets stuck with these things. She was there yesterday. I was elsewhere doing something. And she was there doing something. Somebody bangs on the door. Well, she goes down, and there's the kids there. And those kids that had done that, and they apologize. And he said, somebody told us we ought to come and we ought to apologize. And my wife talked to him and she was kind and she said, you know, I appreciate it, but you know, really the window still needs to be paid for. And, and you've broken it. Make a long story short, and I'm going to give you all the details, but a mother showed up. Now I want to ask you this. If your child broke the window, somebody's building, how, what would your reaction be? 
just what would your reaction be? Now I'm gonna tell you, I know what my reaction would be if it was my son or my daughter. My boy would never do anything like that. He's perfect. Well, no, I, I can believe it. Would you have been disappointed? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I said, don't worry, ma'am. He'll pay for it. We'll pay for it. He, he'll pay. He'll, he said, well, he's young. How's he going to pay for it? I don't know, but I'll make him work. He'll find some work to do. He'll get paid, and we'll pay for it. I'm doing it. You know what that mother said? That mother said to my wife, you expect them to pay for it? You know what? No wonder the kid broke the window. No wonder. See, I'm going to tell you something. We live in a day where people think, I can do what I want to do, and I'm not going to have to pay anything. I'm going to tell you something. Sin always extracts a price. Amen. As R.G. Lee preached a famous sermon years ago, payday someday. Now listen, it's going to be paid for. It's going to be paid for. Now those simple ones that might mock God and, and, and that, that say, well, I don't want anything to do with you. you I, don't try to tell me how to live. Preacher, leave me alone. No, who do you think you are trying to tell me what to do? And, and I'm just trying to gently reprove you as a, a man of God. Listen, I tell you, sin's going to be paid for. You, you can't hide it. You can't hide it. I mean, God sees it. I don't care what you do. He recognizes your sin even if the folks around you can't figure it out. God's got it figured out. He knows. He knows. It's not hidden. That will be paid for your disobedience, your refusal, your rejection, if you will. You know what's going to be the result? Dismay, distress, destruction. Oh, God wouldn't do that. He said he would. He said he would. He said he would. Why in the world do we believe God about some things, but we don't believe him about others? You know, we'll believe the Bible when the Bible says God is love. But when we get to the verses that talk about God being a God of wrath and, and a God who will not at all, you know, quit the wicked, we don't believe that. Oh, he'll overlook that. Listen, can I say this to you? He's not going to overlook it in my life. And he's not going to overlook it in your life. But he'll reprove you. He'll gently try to get you back where he wants you to be. But if you shrug that hand of rebuke and reproof off, it's going to be simple. Hey, you're going to have to pay the price. You're going to have to pay the price. Can I say that this to you this morning? That's true for individuals. And it's true for the United States as a nation. There's a payday coming. There's a payday coming. There's a day coming where this nation is going to have to account for its refusal of God and the Word of God. For turning its back on the God that blessed this nation. There's coming a day. I know our president, I know our Congress today, and think, well, I can pass laws and I can just command people to do everything, and it doesn't matter, and uh, it'll all be okay. Listen, they're going to be an accounting one day. Amen. Right. You, you just check it out. The Bible even talks about God judging the nations. He'll judge you individually. He's going to judge our nation too. Listen, my friend, can I say this to you? It's not too late to turn at his reproof. It's not too late for you to turn. God gently reproves you. It's not too late for you to get right. You say, preacher, you, you don't know what I've done. I don't. But it's not too late for you to get it right. It's not too late for you to avert disaster and destruction. You see, because that God who gently reproves us stands ready with open arms. You may have walked away from him, but he hadn't walked away from you. And he stands with open arms this morning, ready to receive you back to him. I'll tell you, he's just like the prodigal father. He's looking for you to come back. He wants you to return. It's not too late. And it might be too late tomorrow. But it's not too late now. 
not too late now. God still holds that hand out that's extended to you and said, I'll help you if you'll just take my hand. It's still extended to you this morning. Hey, he's reproved. Maybe he's reproved you. But what are you doing? What are you doing? Are you going to refuse it? Are you going to reject his counsel? If you do, the only thing that awaits is judgment. It's judgment. That's whether it's you or me. Now what will you do this morning? Would you stand please with every head bowed and every eye closed today? Listen, he calls to us, all right? He says, turn you at my reproof. That's his call. He wants you to come back to him today. He loves you this morning. He's paid the price for your sin and he's calling you today to come back to him. He wants you to return. He's reproved you. He's pointed out your sin. Hey, listen, you're here this morning. You're guilty. You know it. And nobody's got to tell you. The truth of the matter is I didn't have to tell you. I didn't have to name the sin today. But you know what it is. You're not going to turn your back on God, are you? Don't refuse Him. Don't reject His counsel this morning. If you need to speak to me, I'll meet you here at the front. If God's dealing with you today, Use the invitation time to get right with Him. Maybe you're here this morning. Listen, He's dealing with you about salvation. You've never trusted Him as your Savior. Now listen to me. You, He's, you've never trusted Him. Would you trust Him today? Would you come this morning? Would you have the courage to step out and walk down the aisle meet me at the front? Say, preacher, I want to trust the Savior today. He's calling you. Would you come to Him? Our Heavenly Father, we thank You this morning that you have reproved us. Lord, thank you for that gentle reproof. Lord, I don't want to have to face the judgment of God. But Lord, maybe there's somebody here this morning that's running that risk. You dealt with them, you've reproved them, they need to come. Lord, help them to use the invitation time. They don't need to come tell me, but Lord, they need to humble themselves before you and let you deal with their life. Somebody not saved needs to get saved this morning. Lord, would you use the invitation? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.